All right, now we come to the last chapter in the epistle to the Philippians. We saw in the first chapter the philosophy of Christian living. Chapter 2, the pattern for Christian living. Chapter 3, the prize for Christian living. And now in chapter 4, we have power for Christian living. All of these others would be absolutely meaningless, purposeless, if there was not power. For instance, a philosophy of life is no good unless there's power to carry it out. A pattern is no good unless there is power supplied to have that pattern in our own lives. And a prize is no good if we can't reach it and we can't get to the goal. Therefore, power is all important. So, one of the reasons that the Spirit of God did not let Paul end this epistle as soon as he apparently intended to was because he wanted to let us know that there is power for Christian living and that, as he said, I can do all things in Christ who strengtheneth me. Now, we're going to take a good look at this chapter because it's very important. We have here, and these are the mechanics of it, the division that we have made in the first four verses, we have the source of power. That's joy, as we shall see. And then we have, second, the secret of power, and that's prayer. And then we have the sanctuary of power, and that's contemplation of Christ. Then we have the satisfaction of power, and that's verses 10 through 23 to the end of the epistle. The satisfaction of power is in Christ, and therefore there is the very powerhouse for Christian living. Now let's look first here at the source of power, and it's joy. Listen to him. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown. You see, they were going to be in the presence of Christ someday, and he expected to receive a crown for soul winning, for winning these people to the Lord. And they were his joy down here. Now he says to them, So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. And as Paul says elsewhere, And having done all, to stand. That's the important thing. That's what he said in Ephesians. Now he says, Stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. And that's very important. Stability. The Christian faith will produce stability of life. Now, he says in verse 2, I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syndicate, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, we are back to this little infection that was in the church. Not much. Actually, it hadn't caused too much trouble, but it's not a good thing in any church for there to be little cliques and one group not working with another group. And he says, I beseech you, Odys and Syndicate. They were not speaking to each other. And he says, I want these two dear ladies to be of the same mind in the Lord. Not one to have a carbon copy of the other, but the same mind in the Lord. And if we are together in the Lord, as we've seen before, we're together. And it may be that we have differences of opinions about different things, but that would not separate those that are in the Lord. Now he says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel. And the church in Philippi was noted by the fact that women occupied a prominent place in the early church. And that, may I say, was unusual in that day. My personal viewpoint is that Today, the church has not emphasized the role of women in the church. I believe that we've never had to put up with women preachers if there could have been the office of deaconess emphasized in the church. And I believe that that's an important office and should be recognized. 
problems in the church. The more and more I study the Word of God, the more and more I'm convinced of that. And here we have the fact, Paul says, "...those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also." Now, there's a believer over in Philippi. We have met him. This is the first mention that I know about him. "...and with other my fellow laborers." Apparently, a great company of believers in Philippi, whose names are in the book of life. That was the important thing. Their name was in the book of life. Now, we want to come here now to the fourth verse, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now, joy is the very source of power in Christian living. Rejoice in the Lord always. That means always. That means that regardless of the day, whether it's dark or bright, whether it's difficult or easy, whether we're facing problems and temptations, or whether we're sailing through the sky on cloud nine, whatever cloud it is, that is the thing that we're told and commanded, and this is a commandment now for believers. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say it, he repeats it in case we missed it. Rejoice. Rejoice. That is something you and I can't work up from beneath. It's a fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. That's the second thing. Now, there is no power in a Christian's life except through joy. A sad Christian has no power. And one that does not experience the joy of the Lord has no power at all. Notice what Nehemiah said in Nehemiah 8, 10. This is a tremendous passage, by the way. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's your power. You see, these people many of them that had been in the Babylonian captivity had never heard the Word of God. Never. They were as much in the darkness as any pagan or heathen would be today. And now, for the first time, they've heard the Word of God. They've heard it read. They've heard it explained. And it has been a thrill to their hearts. And they weep because of it. Now, Nehemiah said, wait a minute. You're not to weep. Today is a day, a great day. You're to share the blessings, the physical blessings that God has given to you, and you're to enjoy it. God wants you to. He's given us richly all things to enjoy. And to enjoy means rejoice. And that's your strength. That's your power. You can't be a Christian with power without joy in your life. That's what gets up the steam. That's the source of it. And let me illustrate that, because this is something that the world has taken over. In fact, they've made it rather hypocritical. Today, you find that salesmen that want to sell something, they're generally very happy fellows. You never went in to buy anything at a store and have the salesperson begin to weep on your shoulder. When you ask about a certain product, why, they begin to smile and tell you how wonderful it is. That's the way they do. Well, how far would the full of brush man get if he was a sad little fella that went around weeping at every door? He doesn't use that approach. He's a very happy fella. We had one several years ago, and I say we had one because my wife, somehow or another, thinks those brushes are a little bit better than the ones I can buy at the five and ten cent store. So she does business with it. And one Saturday morning, 
I was up in my study, which is the garage is connected to the house, and I have a room up there that's my study. And I was looking out the window down the driveway, and here comes the full of brush man. He wasn't crying, I can assure you. He had no crying towel at all, just smiling. And I wasn't smiling because my wife had gone to the market, and I knew that fellow, you know, would distract me and take part of my time, and Saturday morning is when I got my sermon into shape. And so he rang the doorbell. I absolutely ignored him, that is, at first. And he didn't let up. He's not going to give up that easy. He put his thumb down on that doorbell, and he stayed with it. And I saw immediately I was going to have to go down. So I went down, out in the door, and I suppose with a scowl, I said, Yes? You think that that in any way chilled him? Why, my friend, he was just absolutely the epitome of happiness. I've never seen anybody so radiant as the fellow was. He's selling brushes. And he said to me, Imagine Dr. McGee seeing you. I never expected this privilege. Well, he knew immediately there's no privilege. I wouldn't buy a brush. And I don't know how he did it, but in the next two minutes, I found him in the living room, and I was talking to him, and I was holding in my hand a little brush he'd given me. Well, you don't put a man out of your living room that's just giving you a brush. So I had to listen to the sales pitch, and he gave it with great happiness. And then I told him that I was sorry that I didn't buy the brushes. My wife bought them. She was at the market, and that I was very busy. Well, that did not deter him. That did not pour cold water on him. Why, he said, that's all right, Dr. McGee, and I wanted to give his brush. Why, no, he said, that's yours. And he went out and went down the sidewalk whistling. And I thought as he went down, my, that man makes a living selling brushes, and that's the way he does it. And I could only wish that tomorrow morning at church the members would come in like that fellow is. Now, I do not know whether he was really that happy or not. That is his sales approach, I'm sure. But a child of God ought to have it in reality, and there'd be power in our lives if we had a little bit more joy in our lives. The fact of the matter is, the world tries to even work that up. In fact, they spend a great deal of money trying to produce joy. And they call it happiness, and they are after that. I tell you, the millions of dollars are spent in nightclubs. These comedians are living like millionaires because that's what they are today. All they do is tell a few stories. And people are shelling out money. Why? They want a laugh. They want a little happiness as they go through this life. And the child of God that goes through today life with a sour look and a jaundiced approach to this world, he'll never have any power in his life. Rejoice in the Lord all way and again, I say rejoice." Now, the world today tries to work it up another way. I have noted in going around to these motels that they all have bars, very few exceptions, and that they also have what they call a happy hour. Well, I've watched folk who go in there, and none of them look happy when they go in, and I give you my word, in an hour or two hours when they come out, I can't see there's been any improvement, but they've had a happy hour. They feel like if they drink enough of the stuff, it will help them overcome the problems of life and give them a little happiness. And a great many people are trying to compensate for the inadequacies in their own lives in that manner. And I saw something new. It was new to me. We were up in Medford, Oregon, and at the Holiday Inn, and I came back, told my wife, I said, they don't call it happy hour here. They call it the attitude adjustment hour. Now, that is quite new, and I would very frankly 
recommend that churches have an attitude adjustment hour. And it would be very helpful, by the way. Every Sunday morning, here comes Mrs. Brown, and she's got a lot of things to tell. She's heard some choice gossip during the week, and she can't wait to spread it at the church. Well, it'd be wonderful if you could take Miss Brown into a very attractive room and give her a cup of coffee and get her in a sweet mood and make her shame to go around and tell those terrible things about some church members. Now, maybe the pastor even. I don't know. She might be talking about him. And then here comes Deacon Jones. And I want to tell you, he's breathing out fire like a dragon of the Middle Ages because things just don't go to suit him. And it'd be nice to take him in and, you know, to cool him off and help him recover his cool so he could go in and enjoy the sermon. May I say to you, we need an attitude adjustment hour, a happy hour in the church. And frankly... The devil sure has got in his licks. He's made folk believe today you can't have fun going to church. And I think you can. I think you ought to. I think it ought to be a joyful place. And that is the place of power. I've heard in times past that the prayer meeting is called the hour of power. Well, that's nice, but we need a little something else. We need to get back to the source. And the source of power is joy. And instead of praying in the prayer meeting for things and for God to do something, why not pray that he give us joy in our lives? There's a song I used to sing at the summer Bible schools when I was a young preacher and conducted them. Down in the dumps I'll never go. That's where the devil keeps me low. Now, that is a song that has a real theological message. That's exactly what he wants to do, is to take away the joy in your life, because that is the source of power. Now, we come to the secret of power in verses 5 through 7. First, he says, "...let your moderation be known unto all men." Matthew Arnold translated that sweet reasonableness. I like that. Let your sweet reasonableness be known unto all men, that you are a reasonable believer, that you are not a bigot in your faith. I think we ought to have deep convictions. I believe in that. But we ought not to be given to bigotry or riding a hobby, always emphasizing some little point. What we need is to emphasize a big point, because we have one. And that big point is the person of Christ. And if you're going to ride a hobby, let him be the hobby, by the way. Let your sweet reasonableness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Paul believed that the Lord Jesus would come at any moment. And Paul wasn't looking for a great tribulation to enter. At all. He says, yeah, the Lord's at hand. And that's quite wonderful. Now, he says here in verse 6, "...be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God." Now, he says here, "...be careful for nothing." And there are those that have translated that, "...be anxious for nothing." or be not overly anxious. The fact of the matter is, I think that Paul is making a play here upon two indefinite pronouns. Now, Paul used this type of reasoning and this type of logic, and he's putting over one against the other these two indefinite pronouns, and I think the emphasis is upon them. Nothing and everything. He says here, And if I may give you the translation that we call here in Southern California, the McGeeus Ad Absurdum translation, it goes like this. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Now, prayer is the secret of power. Now, to worry about nothing. Now, we had a while ago a commandment. This is one of the new commandments he's given us. Rejoice. That's one. 
Now, worry about nothing. Pray about everything. That is the thing that he's saying here. Now, nothing is a very interesting word. Nothing is, it's nothing. (laughs) If you have something, it's not nothing. Now, that's not good grammar, but it sure is accurate. Nothing. Nothing is nothing. And you're to worry about nothing. Now, does that mean that we're to look at life with rose-colored glasses and that we are not to face reality, that sin is not real, sickness is not real, problems are not real, and we're to ignore them? Is that what he means? No, Paul, when he says worry about nothing, it's because we're to pray about everything. Now, nothing is the most exclusive word in the English language. It, believe me, leaves out everything. Worry about nothing. That means nothing. I don't know about you, but this is a commandment I'm afraid I break. I worry. Worry about nothing, but pray about everything. And the reason that we're to worry about nothing is because we're to pray about everything. Now, that means that everything that's in a Christian's life, he ought to talk to the Lord about it. I do not think that there is anything in the Christian's life that should be left out. We should absolutely, we should pray about everything. Someone came years ago, so I was told, to the late Dr. G. Campbell Morgan. And this dear lady said to him, Dr. Morgan... Do you think we ought to pray about the little things in our lives? And Dr. Morgan, in his characteristic British manner, he said to this lady, Madam, can you mention anything in your life that's big to God? You see, when you and I say that we're going to take our big problems to God, what do you mean big problem? It's all little stuff to Him, what we call little He wants us to bring it to him. And what we call big, he says, bring it to him. Pray about everything. Take it all. And I believe that a Christian ought to get in the habit of talking to God and bringing everything to him in prayer, nothing excluded. I have attempted this on several trips I've made by car that involves several hours driving, of just inviting the Lord Jesus to go along with me. And I talk. I just talk to him. I tell him about Vernon McGee. I tell him things about Vernon McGee I wouldn't tell you. And I tell him everything. And I think that we ought to learn to do that. We ought to pray about everything. I think today that I'm going to sharing with you something written by Fenelon, one of the mystics of the Middle Ages. And I think this characterizes and is the thing that Paul means here when he says, pray about everything. And I'm quoting now, tell God all that is in your heart. As one unloads one's heart, its pleasures and its pains to a dear friend, tell him your troubles that he may comfort you. Tell him your joys that he may sober them. Tell him your longings that he may purify them. Tell him your dislikes that he may help you to conquer them. Talk to him of your temptations that he may shield you from them. Show him the wounds of your heart that he may heal them. Lay bare your indifference to good, your depraved taste for evil, your instability. Tell him how self-love makes you unjust to others, how vanity tempts you to be insincere, How pride disguises you to yourself as to others. If you thus pour out all your weaknesses, needs, troubles, there'll be no lack of what to say. You'll never exhaust the subject. It is continually being renewed. People who have no secrets from each other never want subjects of conversation. They do not weigh their words, for there is nothing to be held back. Neither do they seek for something to say. They talk out of the abundance of the heart, without consideration, just what they think. Blessed are they who attain to such familiar, unreserved intercourse with God. 
I carry that little clipping in my Bible and have carried it for years. Every now and then I take it out and read it. I think it's good to tell him everything. Why are we not to worry? Because we are to pray about everything. We are to face our problems. We are to recognize them, but we're to take them to God in prayer. These things, everything in a Christian's life is to be made a matter of prayer. Now, here is something else, and this is really something that looks like a contradiction. It is a paradox, I'll grant. He says here to worry about nothing, pray about everything, that is, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And do you know what Paul is saying here? Paul says you are to thank God when you make a request of him for answering your prayer, because he'll answer it. Now, somebody's going to say to me today, Preacher, you just well stop. You just, well, stop because I've got unanswered prayers. I don't believe you have unanswered prayers if you're a child of God. I believe that God hears and answers all the prayers of his children. Now, we're seeing here that power is needed for Christian living. And this is a chapter about power for Christian living. Now, prayer is the secret of power. Prayer. And I very frankly believe more people are being won today by prayer than any other method. I believe prayer evangelism is still the greatest method of prayer. And I feel that today we ought to call attention to that more because so many people feel like that they've got to be busy as termites if they're serving God. May I say to you, Everything we do for God today should be done by prayer. Now, we made a strange statement. We said, first of all, that we were to worry about nothing but to pray about everything. And that's a command from the Lord. And I find out that I must say I'm willing to testify that I take my burdens to the Lord in prayer. And that sounds very pious, doesn't it? But I have to add after I spread them out before him, then when I finish praying, I pick them right back up and put them back on my shoulder and start out with a burden again. That's my problem. I don't know what your problem is, but this is a command that our Lord has given to us. He said, I want you to trust me. Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. Isn't that wonderful? I wish I could say to you that I'm as free as the birds in the trees. Free as the bees that are gathering honey. And that's the way he wants us to be. He says, why, the birds don't worry about where they're going to eat. And that flower that's so beautiful doesn't spend any time worrying about being beautiful. (laughs) It just is. doesn't even go to beauty part. May I say to you, I wish that I could say to you, I'm living like that and I want to live like that. I was sitting on my patio the other day and a mockingbird. And that is the most interesting mockingbird that's there. He gets my fruit, but I feel like I ought to pay him something for the song he sings to me at night, during the night, while he sings. Now, he's not really singing to me. I don't think he cares much whether I hear or not. But he's got a mate over there in a nest on some eggs. And I'll be very frank with you, I think it's a pretty boring job sit around on a bunch of eggs. And so this male mockingbird, he sings to his wife all during the night. The other morning I waked up around 2 o'clock. My, how he was singing to her. I thought, my, isn't that lovely? How many of you men get up 2 o'clock in the morning and sing to your wife? I tell you, some of us would be in trouble if we did get up that time of morning and started singing. But this mockingbird, I noticed him out in the backyard with disdain. Why, he looked down at me, flew right over to an apricot tree, started eating apricots. He never asked me anything about it. Free? My, how free he is. And I thought, oh my, that mockingbird hadn't worried a bit about getting something to eat. He knew those apricots would be there for him, and he'd be able to eat them. May I say to you, friends, do we really trust God? Worry about nothing. Pray about everything. 
Now, Paul never lets prayer become a leap in the dark. It rests on a foundation. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, he says. God puts faith on a foundation. Now, what about this matter of prayer, then? How do you know God's going to hear and answer? Well, he says, do it with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. Now, he says here, when you go to God and you make a request of him, you ask God to do something for you. Thank him. And Paul says, thank him right there and then. And I know some commentators, they say, now, what Paul meant was that after you get the answer to your prayer, then you're to go back and thank him. Don't forget to go back and thank him. Well, that's all right, but that's not what Paul said. Paul said, and Paul had a way of being able to express himself, and he had the most versatile language that I suppose there's ever been in the world, the Greek language, and Paul was always able to say what he wanted to say. And what he says here is that when you make your requests right there and then, that you thank God for hearing and answering your prayer. Now, somebody's going to say, but maybe God won't answer prayer. And I hear people say today, I have unanswered prayers. Now, Christian friend, I do not believe that you have unanswered prayers. And I think that you ought to be ashamed of yourself for saying that you have a heavenly Father that won't hear and answer your prayer. Somebody says, but I prayed for a certain thing, didn't get it. Well, that's probably true. But you got an answer to your prayer. God will hear and answer your prayer. Always. God will hear and answer your prayer. Now, let me illustrate that again with a very homely illustration. The very interesting thing is that I had a dad that was a good dad. Not a Christian, but he was a good dad. And I never made a request to my dad that he didn't hear it and he didn't give me an answer. He always gave me an answer. I don't care what he was doing. I remember he ran a cotton gin. That machinery had all be running. I'd go in as a little fella, and I'd go up to him. I said, Dad, I want a nickel for candy. <laughs> He'd reach down in his pocket. Right there. Don't care what he was doing. Give me a nickel. I'd go get candy. Always. Then sometimes I'd ask him for something. I remember one time, I asked him for a bicycle. He told me we couldn't afford it. Couldn't buy it. But he answered. He said No. Now, I want to say this, that the answer my dad gave to most of my requests was no, but he answered. And when my dad said no, it was more positive than when he said yes, because when my dad said no, we didn't have any further argument about it. I frankly do not understand some of these young folk today that continue to argue with their parents after they've handed down a decision. I didn't know about that. And as a boy, when I said to my dad, may I have this? He'd say, no. And that was it. And friends, that's an answer. And God has a lot of spoiled children today, and he says no to them, and they run around pouting and say, I have unanswered prayers. You don't have unanswered prayers. God always hears and answers your prayer. And as we said the other day, how are you going to sort out big things and little things? You can always take anything to God in prayer, and how wonderful it is. Again, let me give another homely illustration, because this is an important subject. There was an engineer at the time they were building the Panama Canal, and they had two or three failures, you'll recall. But when the successful project began, They wanted to go right through with it, and so there were no vacations. And to compensate for it, they were sent down to that area to the men working on it, their families. One young engineer, his wife and little boy, was sent down because of the danger of malaria. They were put out on a houseboat. And every afternoon, you could see that young engineer with those big, long blueprints of the Panama Canal rowing himself out the houseboat. One night there, he had those blueprints all spread out, and his little boy was playing at his feet, and he was playing with a wagon. And this engineer, he was busy, but the little boy began to cry. The wheel came off the wagon, and the little fellow worked with it there. He tried his best to put it back, but that was a pretty big project for that little fellow. 
He couldn't get it back, so he did what little boys do when they can't get wheels on wagons. He began to cry. Now, you would think that Dad would shush him right out of the room, would tell the mother, come get this little fella because he's disturbing me. But he was a good father. So the thing he did was he just laid aside the blueprints, and he reached down, picked the little fella up, and asked him, what's the matter? The little fella held up a wagon in one hand, a wheel in another. And that was big stuff for that little fella. It was major. The father took the wheel, put it on the wagon with just one little turn of the wrist. That's all it took. And he kissed away the little fella's tears, patted him, put him down on the floor, and the little fella went playing again. He's a good father. Now, you know who made that father? God put that instinct down deep in the human heart. of Every man. He's got a little boy, got a little girl. <laughs> He's going to stop whatever he's doing. Why? Because we got a heavenly Father like that. When the wheel comes off down here, we can go to him. And it may look pretty big to us. It's not really big to him. And he'll hear. and He'll answer. And he may say no. Now, my experience has been he said no to me more often than he's ever said yes. And I lost my human father when I was 14, went several years before I ever turned to God. And when I did, I found out I had a heavenly Father. And I found out that going to Him, that He says no also. He answers. And let me just give you one instance, and I hope I'm not misunderstood on this. I had a call to a city in the Middle West. And I don't think I ought to give the name of the city because we broadcast there right now. But it's a city that is a great commercial center, very important city. And I went there to try out for a church. And they met and wanted to call me. And I wouldn't give an answer at the time, but told them that if they gave a formal call, I'd give an answer. And very frankly, it would have been yes, because it was a strategic church. But the powers that be in the denomination did not want me there, because it was a church that was located on a boundary near the Mason-Dixon line, and they were still flirting the northern church and the southern church back and forth with each other to get a union. And they felt like these churches right on the border were the critical churches, and they needed a politician in those churches, and not really a preacher, just a church politician. Well, I'm no church politician, not any kind for that matter. And so the powers that be got busy and saw to it I did not get that call. They would not permit the church to call me. Well, I went to God in prayer on that, and I cried to him. I told him how he'd let me down, how he'd failed me at this moment, and my, he'd caused me to miss the greatest opportunity that I thought I ever had. Oh, I tell you, I blamed him, and I found fault with him, and I actually scolded him because he just didn't seem to know what was the best for me. Friends, years have gone by now. I'm almost afraid to tell you how many years have gone by. I would say that more than 35 years have gone by. And I look back now, and my wife and I came through that city, spent the night in a motel. Oh, it was August. Oh, is it hot there. And the air conditioning, the old motor looked like it was going off at any moment. We got up about 4.35 in the morning. We started out. And I said to her on the way out of that city, I said, don't you thank God that he wouldn't let us come here years ago? I can look back now and see that that would have been the tragedy of my ministry. My friend, my heavenly father, he answered. And the thing is, I'm ashamed of it, I didn't thank him at the time. I blamed him for not giving me the right answer. He said no, and he shut that door so tight. May I say to you that the resounding boom was in my ears for several years after that. But now I know that my Heavenly Father, who knew the future, he said no. So the next time that you say you have an unanswered prayer, why don't you say, my Heavenly Father, he heard my prayer, but he told me no, that I must have been wrong. May I say to you, our Heavenly Father hears and answers prayer.
So let your requests be made known unto God. How? With thanksgiving. Now notice, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now the peace of God which passeth all understanding. What kind of peace is that? Well, the Bible mentions several different kinds. There's world peace that the world is after right now. We've spent billions of dollars to try to get it, and the world will never have it till the Prince of Peace comes. He's the only one that can bring peace to this earth. Then there is the peace that Paul talked about in the fifth of Romans when he said, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Now, that's the peace that comes of a soul with a guilt complex, that things are right between you and God, and your sins have been forgiven. An outstanding professor of psychology here in Southern California, who's a wonderful Christian, told me this. He says, the only way you can get rid of a guilt complex is at the cross of Christ. He says, that's where they're taken away. And that's the peace you can know, that your sins have been forgiven. And then there is that peace that's known as tranquility. The Lord Jesus says, My peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Now, it's the peace that he talked about when he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor, and I have it laden. I'll rest you. That's the rest of redemption. Then he said, Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, and you shall find rest in your souls. Now, that's the rest of being in the will of God being totally committed to God. That's a third kind of peace. Now, what kind of peace is this, then, that we have here? Well, he calls it the peace of God which passeth all understanding. So I understand those other three kinds of peace. And this is a kind of peace I don't understand. If I could tell you what it is, it wouldn't be this kind of peace because it passeth all understanding. I think this is a peace that sweeps over your soul At times, I think it's an experience that maybe you looked at a sunset. Maybe you got a view. I stood on the big island of Hawaii, and I looked out at a sunset. That great Mauna Kea, that mountain there that has snow on top of it out there in the tropics. And I looked at the majesty of that sunset and that mountain. And, you know, what a peace. I can't tell you what it was. It passeth understanding. And the peace that came when my heavenly father let me have cancer. and I went to the hospital. And I was frightened to death. And then that night I committed it all to him. And I told him I wanted reality. And he made it real. That's a peace that came that passeth all understanding. I don't know how to tell you what it is, but it's quite real, friends. Now, will you notice it's a peace that passeth all understanding? It'll keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Will you notice something here that's important? There are those today that say prayer changes things. I had a motto. I don't have it now in my study. I have no objection to it. I think it's a good one. Prayer changes things. Well, does prayer change things? I think so. But that's not the primary purpose of prayer. Notice here, we entered this passage in worry. We come out in peace. What's been changed? Have things been changed? No. Nothing's been changed. Storm is still raging. Waves are still rolling high. The thunder is still resounding. And the storm has not abated. Something has happened to the individual. We enter with worry. We come out in peace. What's really happened? I'll tell you what's happened. Something's happened to the human soul, to the human mind. Prayer, my friend, does not primarily change things. It changes us. It changes us. The individual was changed here. That is the secret of power today. Prayer. Now, we see the sanctuary of power, and the sanctuary of power is Christ himself. That is the thing that's important. Contemplation of Christ 
is the sanctuary of power. Now, will you listen to verse 8 as I read this? Finally, brethren. Now, this finally, it means business now. The epistle's coming to an end. Before, back in the beginning of chapter 3, he was just halfway through. But now, he's coming to the last point that he's going to make. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Now, where it says lovely here, whatsoever things are lovely, the better word, I think, is gracious, whatever is gracious. Now, someone has called this the briefest biography of Christ that's ever been written. Just this verse here. And I think it's a good one. Who's true? Well, he is. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Whatsoever things are honest. Who is honest? Jesus Christ. Whatsoever things are just. Well, he's the just one. And he's going to rule someday in justice and righteousness. It's Christ. Well, whatsoever things are pure. Well, who wants to stand up and say you're pure, my friend? I don't think that there are many of us could stand up and say that, but he could say, which of you convicteth me of sin? He's pure. Whatsoever things are lovely or gracious. Oh, how wonderful he was. And whatsoever things are of good report. And if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Who is the one we're to praise? And virtue includes more than what we think. It means that which is manly, that which is noble. These are virtues that have gone out of style. You're a square today if you emphasize these. Well, our Lord was no square, but he was on the square, and he was one that we can think on him. Now, you and I live in a dirty world. I don't care where you go. You get dirty. You can't walk down the streets of Los Angeles without you get dirty. Your mind gets dirty. Your eyes get dirty. The fact of the matter is you get dirty physically even as you look into this world today. And do you ever get tired of the dirt and the filth of it? And television, oh, I look at it, but what sorry things are on it. What worthless things. Someone has called it the great wasteland. Well, it certainly is today. It's just like looking at an arid desert. And yet, their multitudes got their eyes glued to it, and their minds are being filled with dirt and filth and violence and things that certainly do not improve the mind. What can a Christian do? Well, my friend, if you're going to spend your time with the dirt and filthy, and the questionable things of this world, you'll not be a Christian with power in your life. The reason today we got so many namby-pambies, so many mollycoddles, so many weaklings in the Christian faith, here is the problem. They spend their time all week with the things of the world, just filling not only their tummies with the things of the world, but filling their minds and their hearts with the things of this world. And then they wonder why there's no power in their lives. How much time do you spend in the Word of God? How much time do you spend contemplating Christ? And that is the thing we were emphasizing back in Second Corinthians 3rd chapter, verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed under the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, the Word of God is the mirror, and we're beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord. How are you going to behold Christ? The only way in the world you can behold the living Christ is in the Word of God. And as you behold Him, why, there is a liberty that He gives to you. There is a freedom He gives to you. There is a growth that He gives to you. And friends, you can't come by it any other way than in the Word of God. That's one of the reasons that there is so much weakness today. 
I am amazed, oh, I am amazed at how easily Christians are taken in by every wind of doctrine that comes along. They're not actually able to discern the truth and error and any kind of a heresy that meets a responsive chord in the minds and hearts of a great many. And that's disturbed me. Why is it there's so much weakness today in so-called fundamental circles? The one explanation, in my mind, as I've stated, it's my judgment, it's just one thing, ignorance of the Word of God. And that ignorance of the Word of God is the reason that there is so much weakness, how puerile, how inconsequential is the impact of the lives of believers today. And just to go out and hand out a track or spout out the plan of salvation, that's good. I don't mean to belittle that one bit. But my friend, you ought to have a life that backs it up, that's got power in it, because you've been contemplating the person of Jesus Christ and contemplating him in the Word of God. A great many Christians today go to church to be entertained. Someone has said some people go to church to eye the clothes and others to close their eyes. They do not have a worthy motive, even in going to church. And they do not go there to hear the Word of God. They go there to be entertained or go in some kind of a daze and sit there for probably an hour, not any longer, I'm sure, just to feel religious, feel pious. My friend, only the Word of God can bring strength to you. You have to have physical food when you're weak, and you have to have bread and meat if you're going to gain strength. And the Word of God is bread, and it's meat, my friends. And the only way you can grow spiritually is in the Word of God, and as that Word reveals, Jesus Christ. And I wish that I could see him on every page of Scripture. In the book of Psalms, when we were there, letter after letter said they did not know Christ was in the book of Psalms as he is. Well, I wish I could have found him more, friends. The problem today is we need to see him. We need to have the reality of Christ in our lives. And the only way that we can do that is with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. And there's a liberty today, and no one has an excuse. No one. I think one of the things that's going to cause many believers to be ashamed at the appearing of Christ is that they come into his presence and they'll be as ignorant as a goat grazing grass on the hillside of the Word of God. And I'm of the opinion he's going to say to many of us, I told you that. I said that to you. And you did not listen. You did not hear me. The problem today with children is they don't listen to their parents. And the problem today with Christians is they're not listening to their Heavenly Father contemplation of Christ. That is the sanctuary of power. And many of us need to leave the busyness and the dirtiness of this world and go aside and with the Word of God have a sanctuary for the soul where we can contemplate Him, where we can worship Him, where we can praise Him. Now, we sometimes criticize the Roman Catholics for having some little image up and bowing down to it. Well, I don't agree to that. I mean, I don't agree that you ought to have an image. I think it's wrong. But that's another point. It's not right today for Protestants to live as if he doesn't even exist. He's a reality, and we need to contemplate him and fix our minds on him and not be spending our time criticizing those that maybe are bowing down to an image. And that's just what I've been doing, is disagreeing with them. But the whole point that I'm trying to make is, my friend, the substitute is not to get rid of the idols. The substitute is to turn to him. Remember what Paul said to the Thessalonians? How ye turn to God from idols. You have to turn to him first. And when you turn from him, well, you won't need these aids at all. 
And the only way you can turn to him is in the Word. Beholding is in a glass. Lord Jesus, the Spirit of God, wants to make him real to us. Many of us are walking afar off today. Oh, that he might bring us in closer. Let me finish this section of the sanctuary with verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do our practice, and the God of peace shall be with you. And you notice I didn't say that you're to follow me, but Paul gave himself as an example. He is the one that had made Christ the very center of his life and also the periphery of his life. And when a man lives like that, then he has a sanctuary of the soul. Now we come to the last division of the fourth chapter of Philippians, and here we have the satisfaction of power. Now as we come here to the satisfaction of power, this, may I say to you, is a very wonderful section, and it's in Christ. Now, notice Paul really is getting down to the main purpose of the letter, and that was a thank you note to them for the gift that they had sent to him. And he says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. In other words, for two years the church in Philippi had lost touch with Paul. You see, they were very close to him. But when he was arrested in Jerusalem and then in prison for two years, they did not know where he was. Then they heard he was in Rome in prison where he'd been transferred. He'd appealed to Caesar. And they are apologizing to him for not having contact with him and for not communicating with him and not communicating and sending a gift to him because apparently they were... And Paul is excusing them here in a most gracious manner. He said, I rejoice that your care of me flourished again, but you were careful, but you lacked opportunity. You didn't have the opportunity. You'd lost contact with me. How gracious he is, you see. Verse 11, he says, Not that I speak in respect of want. Paul says, I never made an appeal to you. I didn't send out a letter to you telling you that I'd be off the radio next week if you didn't send me a gift. I never did that. And Paul says, I didn't send out an SOS at any time. Paul says, the reason is not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I want to say this is a marvelous statement. I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now, some of my friends who, when I say that Paul is a southerner, and remember I said at the beginning of this epistle, and that I even know what state he came from, and it's from Texas because of the fact that he uses the term I reckon. That's a good Texan expression. But these friends of mine say to me, said, Dr. McGee, He could never be a Texan because he says, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And said if he was from Texas, he'd never be content. And I want to tell you, I think that's taken Scripture out of its context. And I don't think that's the correct interpretation. I want to say that it's marvelous the way this man here didn't make any difference whether he's in prison or out of prison. He was content. Now, many of us, if things are going right and we're in the right place, we're contented. And it's wonderful to be that way. I pray the Lord that in my own life, I ask him, Lord, make me as contented sitting here making a tape as I am when I'm out yonder in Hawaii looking out on the beautiful scene. And that means that The circumstance has a lot to do with us being contented today. But Paul says, I've learned whatsoever state. Now he says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. I know how to be down. I know how to not have anything. And I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. Now Paul says... 
There are times when I don't have anything, and I've learned to be content with that. There are times when, oh, there's an abundance, and God's provided in a marvelous way, and I've learned how to abound. I know that when I retired from the pastorate, I actually thought there'd be a terrible letdown in income and our standard of living. I told my wife, I said, our standard of living will have to really come down quite a bit. And I said, it's going to be hard for us because Paul knew how to abound, but he knew how to be a base. But I said, we're not good at that at all. And I guess the Lord knew about it because, very frankly, I want to say to you, due to the generosity of some very wonderful folk that remember me, my standard hadn't come down. I've been able to live just like I did before. And I'm very frank to say that. And I was prepared to come down, but the Lord didn't bring it down. And I want to thank him for it. And I do thank him for it. And I praise his name for it. But Paul knew how to abound. He knew how to be a base. And it's more difficult, some people say, to abound than it is to be a base. Well, some of us have known what it is to be a base. And I remember Dr. Ironside telling the story that he went over to Grand Rapids each year, years ago, for his friend Mel Trotter, who had the mission there. And the one year when he went over, he got a letter from Mel Trotter to go to the new hotel there, that the man that owned it had been a drunkard, and Mel Trotter, who had also been a drunkard, been converted, he led this man to Christ. And the man says, I want to do something for you, and any time you have guests that come to the city, you send them to the hotel. So Mel Trotter told Dr. Ironside, you go there to the hotel. He went there, and they gave him the presidential suite, the nicest apartment there was in the hotel. And Dr. Ironside just wasn't accustomed to that sort of thing, and so he immediately went to the phone, and he called up Mel Trotter and said, listen, Mel, I don't need this apartment. You don't have to give me this. Just give me a room that's comfortable where I've got a bed I can sleep in and a desk where I can study and a good light, and that's all I need. But I don't need all this luxury. And Mel Trotter said to him in his characteristic manner, he says, Now listen, Harry. He says, That man owes everything to me. He was a drunkard. He's been led to the Lord. And he owes a great deal to me, and he provides that. And it's not costing me anything. It's not going to cost you anything. So he says, Paul said he knew how to be abased and knew how to abound. Now he said, for one week, I want you to learn how to abound in that room. Dr. Ironside said, I learned how to abound in that apartment. It wasn't just a room. In that apartment for that week. Well... God says to us, I want you to learn how to abound. I want you to know how to be a base. Now, Paul says, I know both of those things. Now, he makes one of the most tremendous statements that I suppose you find in the Bible. You hear this quoted by a great many people, and I think that there are only certain circumstances in which it should be quoted. And this is something that's geared to life. This is a verse that gets right down to the nitty-gritty, right down where the rubber touches the road, and this is where this verse needs to be worked out. It's not just a nice little verse to quote. Paul now says in verse 13, I can do all things not through Christ. That's all right, but I mean, let's take the preposition that Paul uses. I can do all things in Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now, I can do all things. Don't stop there, because you can't do all things. You can do all things in Christ. And that means in the context of the will of Christ for your life. Whatever he has for you to do, he supplies the power. Whatever gift that he gives you, he'll give you the power to exercise that gift. And that is, after all, what a gift is. A gift is a manifestation of the Spirit of God in the life of the believer. And therefore, power is in this context of the will of Christ. You're in Christ. As long as you function in Christ, you'll have power to do what he wants you to do. Now, I think I can illustrate that with a very 
homely illustration. As many of you already know, I'm a train man rather than a plain man. I'm plain, P-L-A-I-N, but not P-L-A-N-E. I don't go for the planes. I have to use them, and I find myself flying all over this universe. I wish I didn't have to do it. I wish I could go there by train. And it's gratifying to see the train come back. So I want to give you an illustration of a train between Los Angeles and Pasadena, right here where I live. There comes through here a train known as the Super Chief, and it goes from here to Chicago, from Chicago here. Now, that Super Chief is a tremendous train in my book. Believe me, I think the Santa Fe ought to do something about all this good publicity I give them, or Amtrak, or whoever's running it. And I enjoy that train, and I've noticed that it goes by with tremendous power. And it seems to me, like that super chief says when it goes by, I can do all things in the track between Chicago and Los Angeles that a super chief is supposed to do. And it can do it. It goes over the highest point that any train goes over in this country, way out yonder, Ratoon Pass, as you come out of Colorado into New Mexico or vice versa. And it's a high point, and that train slows down, but it doesn't hesitate. It just goes right to the top and down on the other side, then just tears out through those mountains. It can do all things. Now, suppose that that super chief would say this. For years, I have been taking people back and forth, Los Angeles, Chicago, Chicago, Los Angeles, And very frankly, this gets a little monotonous. I notice that a group of people get off at Flagstaff, Arizona now, and they go over there to the Grand Canyon. They all seem to enjoy seeing it. Now, I've been coming by here for years, and I've never seen Grand Canyon. I wonder if it wouldn't be nice sometime if I took out across the desert here, went over and took a look for myself. Now, I don't know that the super chief ever said that, but I do know this, that one time, coming out of Winslow, Arizona, coming this way, that super chief went off the track, and it went off the track on the side toward Grand Canyon. fact of the matter is, I'm not sure it was headed for Grand Canyon, but I'm here to tell you, it never did make it to Grand Canyon. Never did. It was a wreck. That super chief, as long as it was in the track, as long as it was doing the thing it was supposed to do as a super chief, it could do all things a super chief could do, up and down and up over mountain, down in the valley, across the desert, and into the plains. It could do it. It had no problem at all. But the minute it left the track, it was a wreck. And it was a mess. I came along there that time, and it was just, oh, my. There were cars turned on the side. It just didn't look very good. And it was helpless. It was hopeless the minute it left the track. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. I can do all things in Christ. That's the track the believers to run on. And long as we're in that track of the context, of the will of Christ for our lives. We're a member of his body. He's the head. We're to function there. And Paul says, I can do all things in Christ. I can't do all things. After all, if I could jump like a grasshopper could jump, I'd go out of this building and could jump over it. But I can't jump over it. In fact, I don't jump very high anymore. When I was in school, I was the high jumper, but I can't do that anymore. But a grasshopper does pretty well in his jumping, but I can't. I can't do all things, but I can do all things in Christ. He's the one that strengthens me, Paul says. He'll strengthen you, enable you, give you the enablement to do the thing that's in his will, in the context of your Christian life. And that, my friend, is a tremendous satisfaction. That's the satisfaction of power that he's not putting into my hands or your hands uncontrolled power. 
Yes, he put an atom bomb in my hand. He could, but he hasn't. He has, however, said that as a member of the body of Christ, if you'll function there, I'll give you the enablement. You'll be able to do what you're supposed to do. That's what Paul means when he uses that expression here. Now, will you notice, he says after this, "...notwithstanding..." Ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Paul is getting right down to the nitty-gritty here. And he had made it very clear to them before. You remember, he says, I know how to be content in whatsoever state I'm in. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. In other words, Paul says, I am right where I ought to be. Where was he? In prison, in Rome. And you remember the Philippians had said to him, Oh, Brother Paul, how tragic it is that you are in prison. The gospel is being hindered, and the gospel is being held back. And you're in prison, and it's so tragic. Paul says, I want you to know that the things that have happened to me have happened for the furtherance of the gospel. Oh, I'm right where God wants me to be. And there is no satisfaction like that, my Christian friend. You can go on drugs if you want to, and you can use the gimmicks of this world, and you can take these little courses. Oh, my, how popular they are today. Everybody feels like if they take a little course, that solved the problem, my friend. (laughs) You don't solve them like that. As we've said before, it's only in the context of the Word of God And the satisfaction of power is that when I'm in the will of God, I'm going to be able to do what he wants me to do. And that what happens to me or to you will be for the very best if you're in Christ and you are operating in the context of the will of God for your life. All this matter, if I learn how to say this and do this and act this way, It's just going to solve all my problems. My friend, you can be a psychological misfit and be one of the sweetest little things in the world and turn out to be the biggest hypocrite that there is. Don't you want reality today? Why not come God's way? Why not forget all this little gimmick business? And why not get down to a serious study of the Word of God? Not just the Gospel of John. That's wonderful. But move on to something else. There are 65 other books in the Bible. Why not get the total Word of God, and you'll get the total will of God for this life. And therefore, you will have a basis on which you can operate. And it's a joy, and it's a satisfaction, and it is a sheer delight to know that you're in the will of God, doing what God wants you to do. And I don't care I'm in a little gimmick that you come up with. If you are not going to find yourself in the will of God, doing God's will, then, my friend, you may be able to make a gimmick work for a few weeks. I asked a fellow that paid out quite a bit of money to take a certain course, and he took it, and he said, oh, it's just helped me, it's helped my family. Well, I said, wonderful. I said, how long ago was that? Well, he said, several months ago. But I said, you emphasized to me that right after you took the course, it just revolutionized. Well, he said, it did. Well, I said, how is it going now? Well, he said, we're just about back where we were before I took the course. I said, well, then, apparently whatever it was didn't work. It wasn't the way. I said, how much time do you really spend in the Word of God? My friend, that's the answer. And it's so simple that I'm not able to charge for it, just not able to do that, and I can't work out a bunch of little gimmicks. So all I can say to you, why don't you get to the Word of God? Why don't you study the Word of God? And therefore, Paul is able to tell these Philippians that loved him so, why he says, what's happened has happened for the furtherance of the gospel. I've known how to be a base, and I know how to abound. And I'll be honest with you, I wish I could say that at all times. Things are going well. I do pretty well. And it's quite interesting where the Lord put me when I made the notes 
on Philippians. I was up in Boston area, Boston, Massachusetts, a place called Air. My son-in-law was in the service, and Ms. McGee and I went up there to visit my daughter and my son-in-law. And while we were there, it was, I think, in February, a snowstorm came that paralyzed that entire area. I tell you, on the TV, cars stranded everywhere. People going into houses of individuals had to be taken in like that, schools. And I couldn't even get out of the place. I couldn't even get through by telephone to find out whether I had all my reservations, whether they were good or not, just stranded. And I couldn't get out of that motel. And from the motel, my daughter's apartment, back and forth, I went there and paced up and down. And I found it a little difficult to be content. But it was during that time that I wrote the notes on Philippians. It wasn't until after I found out the Lord is saying, well, now you're going to tell people that in whatever state there is to be content. And I want you to know I'm going to put you in a state where you're going to find it difficult to be content. And I must say that all to be in the will of God, friends, how important that is. Will you notice here now, he moves on, verse 15, he says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. This is a church that was a jewel. And there are churches like that across this country, wonderful churches that have a heart and have a wonderful fellowship, and they're doing wonderful things for God. God's blessing them in a marvelous, wonderful way. And this church was close to the Apostle Paul, and they were the ones that sent support to him. Paul was their missionary. Wouldn't you love to have had Paul as your missionary and been supporting him? Now he says in verse 16, For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Now, you remember Paul had to leave Philippi post-haste. He took French leave. He had to get on the way. And they were going to stone him there, going to put him to death. And he got over in Thessalonica and in trouble again, and no one was helping Paul. But the church in Philippi did. And he says, "...not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account." And I think that church in Philippi has been getting dividends from that day down to the present time. Right now, we're studying the epistle to the Philippians, and someday, whatever profit comes from this study, they're in on it. They're going to get a dividend because they got stuck in the Apostle Paul. All friends to have part in getting out the Word of God. Now, will you notice? But I have all and abound. I'm full, having received of Epaphroditus, the things which were sent from you in order of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. No, the high priest went in and offered incense and are put incense on an offering and might have sended with a sweet smell. And that's what your gift is to God when it's given in the right way. Now he says, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I believe that God blesses those. Now, he's not promised to bless us with financial or physical things, but he does it. That's a surplus. That's something he does just because he does things with loving kindness. Now, he says, Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. May God get the glory. Now, he thinks of something. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. Salute each one of them personally for me. The brethren which are with me, they greet you. Isn't that lovely? All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. While there were those of the nobility, patricians in the household of Caesar. And they were Christians, and they wanted to be remembered to the Philippians. Now he closes with this grand benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And I close with that benediction.